Now, Shropshire is certainly not short of historical figures, as I'm sure you know, especially if you're a regular listener to John's programme. Uh, but surely one of its most famous sons is poet Wilfred Owen. He became one of the most important poets of the 20th century, uh, the national war poet, in fact, despite dying at the tender age of 25. Now, a new biography has just been published, and I'm pleased to say that the author of this biography, Dominic Hibbert, joins me on the line now. Hello, Dominic. Hello. Hello, welcome to the programme. Thank you. Now, I'm uh, fascinated by your biography of Wilfred Owen. Um, it's um, the first biography to come out in quite some time, and quite a lot of um, new revelations about Wilfred Owen as a person, as a poet, as a character, um, seem to have um, come out in your book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the new findings? I don't think I would want to claim that there's any one big dramatic thing but I have checked a great many details, and in many cases, revisions and corrections and alterations and amendments needed making. Um, so it is a different story in some, well, a lot of respects, I think, right through from his education to what happened on the battlefields. What do you think, um, why do you think there was a, a lot of uh, things that were held back before, though, weren't there, by members of his family who didn't maybe want us to know things that they thought, thought would be detrimental to his character? Well, I think we should be clear, first of all, that a lot of what I found wasn't held back. It just wasn't known. Nobody had got round to digging it up. So right. <laughs> that wasn't necessarily anybody concealing anything. But yes, I think the family was anxious that, that he should be seen as an heroic, idealised figure. And his brother, in particular, was uh, very class conscious, wanted people to think that uh, he was a, a outstandingly upright and uh, model person. And so did, I think, clean up the record as much as he could. But Wilfred Owen himself was very class conscious, wasn't he? He claimed at one point to be from an aristocratic background. Yes, but I don't think we should take that too seriously. You have to remember that everybody in the lower section of the middle classes, which is where the Owens were, they were not working class, although one reviewer said they were the other day, um, they were all class conscious. It was terribly important to keep your position and to have the right sort of glass and, and cutlery on the table and those sorts of things. Yeah. So there was nothing special about Owen, I think, in, in being like that. Also in the book, you discuss his homosexuality, which is something that I didn't know about before. And was it widely known before, or, or was it, has it just come out now? Um, no, I think it was, it's very widely known among uh, sort of bookish people who've always been interested in his poetry, but mm. it certainly wasn't known to the general public, I think. I mean, for example, many years ago, I met Sir Cheverell Sitwell, the youngest of the famous three Sitwells, uh, and the very first thing he said to me was, of course, you know that Wilfred Owen was homosexual. So, you know, people like that knew, right. but I think the general public didn't. Mm. Do you think it sheds any light on the reading of his poems? I think it does, yes, because uh, although clearly his sympathy for young men suffering uh, was not exclusively a sexual thing, there is a sexual element in it, and it does make the poems that much more passionate and strongly felt. And I think, too, that in his time, gay men were inevitably, under the laws of the time, outsiders. So they could step back and take a critical view of society in a way that a lot of people couldn't. Mm. And do you think that um, that uh, his poetry, I mean, it's very enduring, his poetry. It, it, it reads now and you can still mean, it means a lot to people who haven't obviously been through the, the horrors of war as Wilfred Owen did. What do you, what do you put that down to? It is extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, he said quite specifically that his audience was going to be future generations, not his own. And he was absolutely right that as the years have gone by, he's been heard by more and more people, even though his language is often um, elaborately old fashioned, I suppose one could say, and that, you know, he's using the language of 19th century romanticism a lot and quoting from the Bible and all that kind of thing. But there's an immediacy in it which arises from intensely strong feeling which itself is based on direct personal experience he went through those things and he knew about them it must have been um, terrible for somebody who is quite obviously a very sensitive person to go through the horrors of the trenches in the first world war yes it, it was um, he was a, a tough and highly trained officer one has to be clear about that I mean he spent a year training and he'd gone in through very good training and his superiors clearly thought well of him, and he did his job in the front line very efficiently. But in the end, he was caught in a shell explosion. He was blown into the air while he was asleep. And not surprisingly, that left him badly shocked. 
Um, and it took him then, oh, well over a year to recover. Um, but he was by no means the only person who went through that, of course. There were many thousands of young officers who suffered the same kind of thing. He was trapped as well at one point, wasn't he? He was trapped in a, in a hole um, with all sorts of, you know, horrific bits and pieces and body parts from people he knew and all kinds of things, which must have been not helped the situation, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, he was trapped several times, actually. Yes, I suppose three times, really. First in a German dugout with his platoon, uh, and then in a cellar that he managed to fall into behind the lines, but he was badly concussed for a while. No one knows quite how long for. Uh, and then after he was blown into the air by the shells I've just mentioned, he spent time sheltering in a hole uh, surrounded by the bits of one of his fellow officers who had actually been buried a fortnight before and then clearly blown out of the ground again by a shell. So that must have been an unspeakably dreadful experience. And he, this, he had a nervous breakdown at some point. Was that shortly after all these things happened? Yes, I'm not quite sure you could say it's a nervous breakdown, but yes, he suffered from what at that time they called neurasthenia, which was a sort of mild form of shell shock. Mm. But it took a long time to treat and recover. And there was at some point um, somebody accused him of cowardice, which, didn't, uh, which helped him on the way to, to the hospital, I'm sure, after all he'd been through. I think that may have been the last straw, yes. Mm. What was it's that about? Very, well, it's very difficult to know exactly what happened, uh, but there was a, a rather unpleasant major who was temporarily in charge of the battalion and I think must have made some remark, you know, that young Owen was getting windy, that sort of comment. Uh, I don't think it was nothing formal. It wasn't a written report or anything of that kind. And people nowadays who say that Wilfred was in danger of court-martial are way off the point. But it, it was a terrible insult for a First World War officer to have any hint of cowardice aimed at him, and it was just the last straw for Wilfred. Now, when he, when he died, it was uh, shortly before the end of the war. Could you just fill us in on, on that? Because that's, that's quite interesting. It was um, poignant and sad, really. It was terribly close timing. It was the very last pitched battle of the war with the British Army getting across the Sabre Canal uh, and their success in doing that was finally what persuaded Germany to bring the war to an immediate end. So it was the, really it was the final victory. And most of the battalions involved, and there were many of them, got across the canal without so much difficulty. Two had trouble. One of those was Wilfrid's. They were held up. They couldn't get across. Their bridge was broken. And uh, their attack was called off. And he was killed perhaps... 10 minutes before it was killed off, it's before it was called off. Nothing more than that. Amazing. Very close. Yeah, and this mm. says, um, as, as the bells celebrating the armistice were ringing in Shrewsbury, the postman arrived to give his parents the telegram. Well, that's what's always said. Yes, I, I can't actually prove that. The telegram did arrive that day, and I suppose the bells were ringing all day. So, yes, I expect it's true. Yes. Yeah. And uh, his poetry, though, at the time, I mean, he was, he was 25. He had a, a very short life but uh, he produced a tremendous amount of poetry. But at the time, not a lot of it had been published, and he certainly wasn't famous by his death, was he? Not in the least, no. Only five poems were published in magazines, and they were scarcely noticed. No, he, he was uh, almost totally unknown. Uh, and all his great poems were published, were, sorry, were written in the last year of his life. Um, so there really wasn't time to get them into print. Mm. And it wasn't until the early 1920s that he started to get known, and really not until the 1960s that he became nationally a big name. What do you think that was then? Was it uh, something to do with Vietnam and the, uh, the liking yeah. for protest at that time? Uh, that's right, and several other things. For example, Benjamin Britten's War Requiem, which set Wilfred's poems to music alongside the Latin Mass. That had a huge effect and boosted the sales of his poems enormously, apparently. Mm. And then, um, do you think that he knew somehow, though, that he was going to be famous after his death? Like um, you said that he was, you know, he thought that his poems were for future generations. Yeah. Yes, I think think he felt sure he was going to have an audience, yes, yeah. and he certainly hoped he was going to be widely known because he wanted his message to get across. But I don't know how he could have known. You know, people say, too, that he knew he was going to be killed, and I don't think that's true. Mm. Uh, we can't read the future, can we? But I he suppose, hoped, anyway. <laughs> I suppose that in a, in a situation that, that he was in, in the, in the trenches, that it's got to cross everybody's mind in that situation anyway, but you can hardly call it a, a psychic uh, 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, there were very large numbers of young men who, who wanted to get their poems into print before they were killed, if they were killed. So there were thousands of war poets. Yeah. But Wilfred stands out head and shoulders among the others, I think. And he was very friend. He was very good friends with uh, Siegfried Sassoon, the other war poet as well. Did Sassoon have an influence on his poetry? Oh, considerable, yes. They met by sheer chance in hospital in the middle of 1917, and uh, Wilfred was... Well, he was full of hero worship, really, for Sassoon, and set out to imitate his poetry. And that was the first time he'd actually written about the war directly. And his poems start from that point. Mm. But very quickly, he found a voice of his own. I suppose you have to wonder what his poetry would have been like and whether it would have been as good if it weren't for the war. You know, I mean, that seemed to galvanise his, his imagery and his, his thoughts completely. There's much truth in that, though on the other hand, a lot of the imagery and language and ideas that he used, he had actually been experimenting with before the war. So that it, there is an extraordinary continuity in his development. And I think he would have gone on. He was very ready to take in new influences. He'd have read T.S. Eliot and, and uh, written in that sort of style as well. And I think he'd have written a lot of good stuff later on. Mm. Well, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you ever so much for joining us on the programme today. And uh, I've, I've enjoyed what I've read so far of your book. I'm, uh, I'm working my way through it. But it's, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, it is, uh, it is a, a fascinating insight into one of uh, Shropshire's heroes. Thank you for joining us, Dominic. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, Dominic Hibbard's biography, simply titled Wilfred Owen, is published uh, in hardback by Weidenfeld and Nicholson. It'll cost you £25 but it's worth every penny. A weighty tomb, believe me, and very good it is too.